So this was another random pick from the ones that we haven't done so far, sort of middle of the pack, which takes us into open cluster territory. So I've chosen M46, which is an open cluster of stars, sort of right next door to us, basically, in terms of the galaxy. It's within our own spiral arm, same spiral arm the Sun is in in our galaxy. But it's actually one of the most distant open clusters in the Messier catalogue, which kind of tells you how difficult it is to see through our galaxy, because we can really only see the things that are really close to us. It's a pretty substantial open cluster. It's got about 500 stars. It covers about an area about the size of the full moon. So here's a picture of it, and you actually get two Messier objects for the price of one, because this is Messier 46 over here, which we're talking about. And here's Messier 47, which we'll save for another day, but is also an open cluster. What's M47? That's quite a nice looking one. It is. Well, it's, it's the same thing. It's an open cluster, yeah. but it's much closer and the stars are much brighter. M46, I've told you pretty much all I have to tell you about M46 itself as an open cluster. Um, but what I liked about it was discovering what was also in the picture. If you look at that cluster here, you can see that there's a fuzzy little dot here. Charles Messier discovered the cluster as a whole, but about 15 years after he did, William Herschel, looking more closely, discovered this object sitting in the middle. Uh, and his son John later described it as sort of velvety around the edges. And what it is, is a beautiful example of a planetary nebula. So this is NGC 2438. And at first glance, it's really quite difficult to decide whether that planetary nebula is actually part of the cluster. So it's a great alignment, you can see. It's you know, right on the edge there. But there are a number of reasons we might be skeptical about it being actually a member of the cluster. Now, a planetary nebula is one of the end stages on the way to the final endpoint of a star's life. So a star like our sun, about the mass of our sun, will contract after it runs out of nuclear fuel into a white dwarf, but before it does so, it throws off massive amount of material out in its outer layers. When it becomes hot enough, it ionizes that shell of gas and produces what we call a planetary nebula. So it throws off the gas first, and then later on it will ionize what it threw off earlier? Yeah, it might lose up to half of its own original mass, and then later on it switches essentially switches on that gas um, by irradiating it with really hot photons. But this throwing off of mass is nothing like a supernova. It's a much gentler thing. Uh, yeah, gentler, depending on your point of view. I mean, this is what's going to happen to our own sun um, in uh, you know, a few billion years. And you know, the Earth is not going to find it particularly gentle at that time, because we're probably going to be enveloped. It's a much more gradual process than a supernova. A supernova happens very quickly, extremely violently. The formation of a planetary nebula, comparably speaking, takes a much longer time. But to answer the question, is this planetary nebula part of this cluster? Well, if you look more closely, you, you can get a clue, which is in this beautiful picture where you start to see all the internal structure of all the gas, the shells of gas, you can see that the stars behind it, some of which will be part of the cluster, are, are reddened, they look redder. And that's because we're seeing them through this gas from the planetary nebula. So this gives us a hint that whether it's part of the cluster or not, it's actually sitting between us and the cluster. It's getting in the way of the light from those stars, which is, is, is becoming red. But it really needs um, measurements of the radial velocity of the, the, the cluster and the planetary nebula to solve this problem. And when you do that, and so, We'll talk now about um, objects being redshifted. We're often used to talking about that in terms of galaxies and the expansion of the universe. That's not what's happening here. Um, nothing within our galaxy is being affected in, in this measurable way by the expansion of the universe. But nonetheless, the stars are moving relative to us. We are moving relative to the stars, and that will cause shifts in the spectral lines. And so when we look at the radial velocities measured from the spectra of these objects, we find they have a dis difference of 30 kilometers per second in their velocity relative to us. That conclusively proves that right now that, that planetary nebula is not part of the cluster because it would, that, that cluster is, is quite loosely gravitationally bound, but it would only take a little bit of energy to dislodge a star from that and a, a little kick in velocity. And that might be 
you know, just one or two kilometers per second. So for something to be running away at 30 kilometers per second relative to the cluster means that it, it's not being held onto by the cluster at all. And in, in fact, independent distance measurements puts them at really quite different distances altogether. I believe the planetary nebula is moving faster away from us. So I suppose it's moving towards the, it's catching up to the cluster, I suppose, but they are several thousand light years apart. But that's not all, that's not all. Because when you look with an even deeper exposure at the edge of this uh, interesting region, you see something else, which is down here. So there's another smudge of something, some nebulosity, to put it in Messier terms, at the edge of this cluster. And when you look at that with the Hubble Space Telescope, you see this beautiful object. Wow. And this does, in fact, turn out to be part of the cluster. So the star that's causing this beautiful mess is a member of the cluster. We can tell that by its distance, its proper motion, and its age. Um, but what you're seeing here is a stage in stellar evolution that comes just before a star becomes a planetary nebula. So this is called a protoplanetary nebula, which is another really unfortunate name because it gets mixed up with what we call the disk of debris that's collecting before you form an actual star. So the other end of a stellar lifetime. But this is basically a, a, a proto-planetary nebula. So it's before the planetary nebula stage. Uh, the star uh, responsible is hidden by this dust cloud here. And what you're seeing is really violent stellar winds, material being um, moved at a million kilometers an hour um, in these collimated jets. And then it slams into the surrounding interstellar medium, this really diffuse gas that pervades the galaxy. And it causes these highly ionized shock fronts. So basically, you know, it's ramming up and, and, and being shock heated. And so this is a phase that doesn't last very long, so we're kind of lucky to catch it in the act. But I liked how in this one Messier object, we went through all these different stages of stellar evolution and also found some really beautiful objects along the way. Okay, Brady, what would you call that object? Well, like almost everything in space, I would probably name it after a jellyfish. <laughs> um, it does look kind of... I did at first think jellyfish. Uh, oh, ten pin. It looks like a ten pin. That's not bad, and that's pretty close. It's called the Calabash Nebula. The Calabash being those really elongated ancient vases um, they used to find. But the other name for it, which I think is kind of funny, is the Rotten Egg Nebula, because it actually contains massive amounts of sulfur in these gas clouds. So if you could smell it, it would be a bit stinky fringes of kind of bluey light from other uh, lines of, for example, oxygen, also lights up in the kind of greeny, bluey part of the spectrum. Another interesting fact, actually, this mountain was almost chosen as the site for the VLT, which ended up over there. <laughs>